Hello, we're joined today by brothers Ron and Russell Mail of the band Sparks and Edgar Wright, filmmaker and director of the documentary film, The Sparks Brothers. I've got to say, I loved this film. I, um, when the Sundance lineup was, was announced, I purchased a Sundance pass just so I could see the film. I wanted to make sure that, that I could do that. Edgar, I'm a big fan of your work and Ron and Russell, I've had the pleasure of seeing you a few times over the years. Uh, the last time I saw you was in 2017 at the chapel in San Francisco, and it was amazing. Thank you. So Edgar, I'd like to start with a question for you. Since this is your first documentary, I'm wondering when you approached Sparks with the idea of doing, doing a documentary about them, what was the initial meeting like? Did you, did you involve them in the planning, like in the look and feel of the film? I feel like you have a similar sensibility, you know, visual style, but I'm wondering, was it a casual conversation or was it a summit? <laughs> and was there, you know, were there things that were off limits for the film? I don't, maybe, Ron and Russell, maybe you, you can- were wearing, You were wearing underpants, I think. So it was, it was pretty casual, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I don't remember like us kind of having a, a serious meeting about what it should be. Like, uh, I, I remember in terms of pitching it because I had um, got to know Ron and Russell a few years before and I had kind of, um, I'd been a fan. Uh, I mean, I've been a, a, a big fan in the sort of like, particularly in the last 20 years. I was certainly like very aware of them from the age of five. And I guess part of the reason I wanted to do the documentary is because up until meeting Ron and Russell, they had been a bit of a riddle to me. And then, and then as I sort of like, I just, and, I, and then I felt without necessarily realizing that it was staring me in the face, I had this idea that there should really be a documentary about Sparks that would, could give an overview to people to people who are sort of like that, even some people who know who they are, I would hear occasionally from people that they said, oh, I want to get into Sparks, but I'm daunted <laughs> by the prospects. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I, you know, having an overview of the band would be a good thing because it's like such an amazing story and it's such a diverse discography. And there are like, and I was very aware as I split time between London and Los Angeles, that different people in different parts of the world had a different image of Sparks, just from people that I talked to. Um, and so that was fascinating to me. And I couldn't really think of another band that had, had different periods of success in completely different continents. So, I, so and I, I'd been sort of, um, I'd been droning on about doing, not, not about me doing it, about somebody doing it. And I was at a Sparks concert, probably the same tour that you saw I was at the LA day at the El Rey in 2017 and I was saying to my friend the director Phil Lord who come with me oh you know the only thing stopping uh, these guys from being the biggest band in the world is is there should be like a documentary like an overview of the band and he said you should do that and I was like yeah and maybe because it was him I said yeah I will <laughs> and then I told Ron and Russell about the idea that night after that, I don't remember, and maybe you guys can, I don't remember us sitting down to sort of formally discuss it really, other than that I just told you about some of the ideas that I had in terms of um, how to shoot the, um, I wanted to shoot the, um, the interviews all in the style of the Richard Avedon cover of Big Beat. And I think between us, we started to get together the sort of like the list of people that we wanted to interview. Um, and then, you know, do you remember anything other <laughs> than oh, that? We, I mean, we're, we're not as methodical as most people in what we do, you know, and, and to be honest, we, we, we weren't, we never really wanted a documentary about the band, but, but Edgar came to us and just in a general sense, I mean, we, we loved his films, obviously, but, but, you know, just as, passion about the project so it seemed like that uh, you know we didn't have a list of what needed to be in the sparks ultimate uh documentary i mean it was just more of a of a thing let's let's just do do this and we you know we once we had faith in the person doing it then you know it just all 
fell into place. I mean, we weren't kind of micromanaging the thing. I mean, it it we wanted we wanted this to be an Edgar Wright film, and it and you know to our delight, it turned out to be that. We had been hesitant in the past even to to do a documentary about the band just because we felt that maybe what we do via our music and what you know about the van, the band just by the album covers and videos that you've seen of the band that maybe that speaks louder than a formal uh, analysis of the band and in, in, in a in a film way and so we were hesitant in the past but when when Edgar, when we had met Edgar and when the idea had come to do a documentary and it being directed by Edgar, then kind of our hesitancies in the past that we had had in the past were kind of immediately uh, cast aside. And we said, well, this, this has to be good because, um, you know, Edgar makes good movies with a, with a sensibility that we thought would be um, in line with Sparks' sensibility. So what, what Edgar does, you know, through, through his films, we thought that he could best convey what Sparks does via its music. I mean, to be honest, the, the, the final selling point, I mean, it, it wasn't that we needed to be sold, was, was just that the emphasis would be on the present day as much as in, in the past, because a lot of people that have come to us, you know, they, they kind of want to make it, uh, a trip down memory lane and that that all is a part of 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 you know of the story if you will but just but it was really important for us just because we kind of feel that what we're doing is current and you know and, and as strong as what we've done in the past that that in a documentary that that the present day would be treated with the same kind of balance as the as the past well, Ron and Russell, a question for you. Um, the, the times that I've seen you and just over the years, whenever I've seen you, the, the playbook might be different, but the energy is the same, the vitality and, and the, just, just the, <clears throat> the dynamic presence that you have on stage. But with 25 studio albums in over 50 years, how do you stay fresh and forward thinking? Because it's a lot easier to, it's a lot easier to remain the same than to move forward all the time with, with new fresh ideas. Yeah, well, it's, that's, I think that's the battle that, that, that you face and that we're, we're aware of and we desperately try to um, combat that where, you know, what you mentioned about it's easier to remain the same and just kind of keep it on autopilot, but we're really aware of that. And I think the reason that, that we're, that we do have as many albums as we, as we do and that the career, at least in our mind is sort of still vital to this, to this day is that we constantly try to, um, you know, outdo what we've done previously and to kind of, hope that the the latest thing that we we are doing if someone has no knowledge of the band at all and they pick up on the band just for what you're doing now that they would be uh you know as taken by taken by it as something that you might have done you know uh decades ago and so that's the kind of the ultimate Complement and ultimate goal is kind of somebody finding what we're doing right now as being if they just see it in a as a completely new band uh, and and think it's relevant and 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 speaks to them now then that's the kind of the the ultimate goal and to not be relying on our past uh, you know it's a it's a fine line too because we have fans from the past from from the beginning and obviously you don't want to deceive them or do something that's that kind of uh uh you know would be disappointing also to the people that have stuck with it from the beginning but we think that that the people that have been there for the long haul also appreciate the fact that they don't know exactly what to expect from the next thing that we do and hopefully whatever that move might be they're, they're going to appreciate it i do feel that you can jump in at any time 
you know, and anyone, anyone could jump in at any time to Sparks Music and find what they're looking for. You know, it's, it's, because it's always fresh. Well, that's and, what we really like about the documentary that we found that so far in the, uh, the few places where it's screened, that, that the reaction is people are, people are new, new fans are being made, which is, which is fantastic. Um, but they're entering from different places and it doesn't seem to be a problem. You know, we're, you know, hearing people saying, oh, I just, you know, they, the, they've picked up on sparks from the latest album and it's great. Or they've gone back and, you know, the, the first album to, they, they've investigated as number one in heaven from 79. It kind of, it doesn't really matter. And that's, that's really uh, for us, that's the most satisfying thing where it's all, it's a body of work and it's not necessarily time stamped of a certain period. Ron agrees. Oh, I agree, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Edgar, you've probably been asked this before, but how did you get everybody together? I feel like, first of all, do you know everybody that you interviewed? Because I feel like you know everyone and everyone wants to work with you. <laughs> well. I, there, there were some people that I had not met before this documentary that were kind of like, you know, you're cold calling to a certain extent. I mean, I will say this is I didn't really have to twist anybody's arm to be in it, which was great. And, and in some cases, there were certainly people that I had not met previously to the documentary, like Tony Visconti or Todd Rundgren or like John Taylor. Um, and Nick Rhodes from Duran Duran and uh, and some of the, some other people. Um, and then there were people that I was kind of, there's people that I was well aware were fans. And then there's sometimes there'd be people that I would just guess they were fans. And I'd usually, that would, my instincts would prove me uh, right. Like Beck and Flea, it was a sort of, uh, who were both of whom I had worked with. It's just a, an, e an easy like question to ask over text. Hey, you must be a Sparks fan, right? <laughs> and they say, I love Sparks. And it's like, so that happened quite a lot. And, and usually like four times out of five, I was right. And then, like I said, so, so the, the nice thing about it, and I think this speaks very highly of Ron and Russell, is everybody wanted to talk about it. And everybody that they've ever worked with wanted to talk about it. One of the things I find personally really quite sweet about the documentary it's even when there are band members who have essentially been like fired or let go <laughs> or like, you know, which is like in the, in, the, in the whole scope of the documentary, it totally makes sense. But what I thought was really sweet was that everybody had huge respect for them. And I don't know how you felt, Ron and Russell, watching that, but to see the old band members talking about that and, and, and saying like, I, you know, like what an amazing you know, kind of achievement. I thought that was really sweet. So it, it, the, 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 the truth of it is I didn't really have to persuade anybody to be in it, which was great. Was no, there both, both, the, both the things that Edgar mentioned, just the, uh, that past band members um, were, were so gracious in what they were saying about being in the band. And then the other, the other side that all of the people that did speak uh, that weren't in weren't part of Sparks at any period, but were are in other bands or else other uh, creative uh, areas. They most of them we we've never met either, and so to see them speaking about Sparks and speaking so um, you know so so amazing so articulately about the band, and you know we were shocked when Edgar said, "Oh, this week um, I'm going to be interviewing," you know. Mike Myers and Mike Myers, what, what, <laughs> how could Mike Myers, what would he like about Spark? You know, we were just, we were, you know, just uh, so, so happy and proud that of all these people that from various, various creative areas that were speaking about the, the band, you know, and, and, you know, at your said, oh, you know, we're doing, we're talking with Neil Gaiman, we, Neil Gaiman, that, why you know <laughs> and and so and then this then then to see the result of that how how articulately um he spoke about the you know the the meaning his interpretation of of one of the album covers and, and all of that that there was it wasn't just sort of a blanket yeah i like them as a has a good beat 
you know, it was talking about the possibilities of what could have been happening in the album cover propaganda being tied in the back of a boat and then and then Edgar giving well it could have been though this interpretation of what happened ultimately in that in that scene so it, it was it was just a you know to to bring out those elements that we would never imagine that someone like like both Edgar and, and Neil Gaiman for instance would be uh, analyzing the specifics of that album cover. Uh, so it was, you know, it's amazing. Some reviewers said that they wanted to see uh, a, a, another documentary that was just me and Neil Gaiman um, <laughs> extrapolating Sparks album covers. <laughs> Can we that say that good. the next film? <laughs> <laughs> sure, put that on the internet. <laughs> 2023. Ron and Russell, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question about how you how you maintain your relationship with each other you know in in the in the film you talk about how the kinks were an early influence and i was a huge kinks fan and i can remember seeing them a couple of times and being quite disappointed because they got into a fight on stage through guitars walked off it was really very disappointing like really you couldn't give me 90 minutes so <laughs> there's there's just there's, I just feel like in the film, I got a sense of, of tolerance, but like real deep respect. And I wonder, does that have anything to do with, with being familial, with being brothers? Or how did, you know, how do you avoid like, the, like even the Everly brothers, they didn't speak for like 10 years. How do you maintain this, this, this working relationship? And just, you know, just, just a, a really nice sense of respect. Well, you know, it's so hard because I, I'm not behind the scenes of all of those other brother problem areas. <laughs> but, but you know, I, I, the one thing I do know is that there's no way that we would have continued this long if we weren't brothers. Because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really insecure in what I do as, as a songwriter. And to have to go to a stranger with ideas that are sometimes half crazy or half baked. Uh, I don't have to worry about that because, uh, you know, the, the embarrassment uh, element is, isn't there with, with someone who you've been working with so long and who is a brother. And the other thing is that our, our uh, positions within the band aren't overlapping. There isn't a competition for the guy who is, you know, it's, it, uh, Russell is the lead singer and, you know, he's, he kind of uh, is genetically a, a lead singer type and, and I kind of know what my place are, is and they, those kind of situations, they don't overlap. So we're, we're really comfortable with it, with our position within the band and, you know, working with, within such a bubble, the way that we work, uh, a lot of things can go unsaid just because our, our sensibilities are really the, the same about what pop music should, should be. I, I was gonna say like the thing that you, you say in the documentary, both of you, which I think is really sweet and also is something that's like quite profound to sort of be able to kind of, you know, that you can, you can see that because sometimes people can't understand how they work. But it is the fact that you respect each other's place and you don't try and do and you know that you can't do exactly what the other one can do. And there's and the fact that you're aware of that is like, unlike every other warring brothers in band, the Bee Gees, the Kinks, the Everly Brothers, Oasis. The problem is, is that there's two people who both want to be the, the star. And the fact that you two are comfortable with your places in the universe is, I think, so sweet, not just as rock stars, but just as brothers. Uh, the only time was a problem was when we were first starting out and there were, there were, it was a five piece band and there were four people who really did look like the uh, ideal British band, which was our kind of aim at the very beginning to be uh, a British band. But I kind of, uh, didn't fit that uh, profile somehow. So I had to find an alternative to uh, grab attention. 
you know, Edgar, one thing I noticed when I watched the film that I was not expecting is that I was really kind of moved by the, um, by, you know, like when, when you like a band, you don't, you know, you, you, it's not like you're thinking really deeply about them all the time, but just, you know, the work ethic and the structure and the schedule of, you know, how they, how they move through their, you know, musical life, I found, I found really moving and I wasn't expecting that. I don't always get that with the music documentary. We, we screened the, the Bee Gees film last year at our film festival. And um, I, I got that same feeling of just being moved. And I'm wondering when you were going through the process of making the film, were there things about them that you that you didn't know and, and kind of discovered on a deeper level that moved you? Well, I, I, it wasn't so much that, it's more like that there were questions that I wanted to ask. So part of the doing the documentary, even though I knew Ronald Russell before, is because there were there were things about it that I found fascinating. And 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 part of that really is like is the sort of the answer to it in terms of like what keeps you going for this long and more importantly what keeps you kind of innovative for this long because it's really unusual and I think there's a sort of a number of factors to it and I think sometimes the struggle is has become sort of like has become the inner strength I think in that weird way maybe if you guys had been stratospherically big when you first started you wouldn't necessarily be making the output that you're making now. And I think Ru Russell, you said at one point that like the story of Sparks was like the tortoise and the hare. And I think that's right. And I think that's that's the thing that I was sort of aware of like, because uh, I would ask myself the question of like, how is it possible that these guys are making stuff as good as their kind of, there is no golden period for Sparks. The truth is, is that the albums in the last 20 years are as good as the, the 70s albums and so that was the kind of the riddle that I wanted answered and I think what I found and I think you guys are sort of aware of this is that and the important thing in the documentary of covering every album is because the misses are as important if not more important than the hits you know the hits are great but the misses are character building <laughs> and, and the and also as you discover in the documentary there's very few albums that there isn't a secret fan of like both i know ron and russell you were both like flabbergasted did that flea like came out as a hardcore fan of introducing the 1977 uh, album so i think that's the thing that i found is is that so some of these things are, are there's questions i wanted answered and, and and i think for me as well there was an element of, of it that wasn't planned, but I feel is um, seeing some of the stuff where you guys were not sort of, you know, struggling in the sense of just kind of like keeping your head above water to be able to kind of like just do your work. That I think we're in a we're in a period now which is which was bad already before the pandemic and has now been made doubly worse. Where like musicians are in real crisis because a lot of them can't make a living doing it and uh, and I think it's going to be really like sad that the that not just the pandemic but what kind of like is happening with um, residuals from streaming and stuff is like not enough for people to kind of like pay their like rent or their mortgage and I think a lot of people will leave the music industry. And so one of the things that came out of this that I thought like, well, this is something that will actually be, I think, inspiring is that Ron and Russell's like work ethic and their way of approaching their art, I think is something that is just an inspiration to anybody with creative ambitions, not just musicians. I think anybody who has creative ambitions, I would say, I would hope would look at the documentary and find it completely inspiring in terms of just a pursuit of your kind of of your ambition but also just a persistence of vision so I think that's what I got out of it well the film is wonderful and we're going to wrap this up but um the Sparks Brothers documentary of release date June 18th yeah June 18th um Go see it. It's wonderful. Ron, Russell, Edgar, thank you so much. You've all been brilliant. Very sweet. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. 